नमस्कार दिस इज उमा चरण पति डेपुटी रजिस्ट्रार ऑफ गंगाधर मेरे यूनिवर्सिटी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द गंगाधर मेरे यूनिवर्सिटी एंड द फैमिली जे एम यू फैमिली आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू द सेकेंड लेक्चर ऑफ द वेबिनार सीरीज ऑन कॉन्फिगरिंग भन्नकल रीजन एंड बिलोंगिंगनेस हिस्टोरिकल परस्पेक्टिव थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग विथ अस Uh, we have with us our honorable vice chancellor professor n nagaraju sir who is the brain behind all the academic engagements and all the programs we are having in the gmu campus and uh, we are fortunate enough to have got uh, uh, the renowned historian educator and commentator political scientist and poet uh, professor bishnu mahapatra sir who is the chief guest and chief speaker on uh, this occasion sir will be talking about uh, thinking about region its power and limits in our time thank you so much sir for joining with us thank you for honoring the invitation of our esteemed vice chancellor and uh, we are hopeful that uh, our students teachers and research scholars will be uh, blessed with your knowledge experience and expertise thank you and namaskar from jm university family <clears throat> i take this opportunity to welcome all our teachers faculty members students research scholars all invited guests members of the syndicate and academic council uh, members from the civil society and everyone those who have joined this program from different colleges and universities of this area and also outside odisha thank you very much and uh, on behalf of the university we are thankful to uh, the team history led by dr umakant mishra the head of the school of history all the faculty members student research scholars and we are also thankful to our chairman pg council professor mohin mohammad sir uh, registrar shrimati jugleshpuri das and all all members of the gmu family for their support in organizing this program thank you so much uh, now uh, i request our honorable vice chancellor professor n nagaraju sir for his opening remarks thank you dr prati uh, professor mohammad uh, chairman pg council madam das the registrar other colleagues and uh, faculty members i join all of you in welcoming professor vishnu mahapatra uh, this uh, talk and, uh, this is the second in the series yesterday we heard about the historical uh, historicizing categories of the region and today probably professor mahapatra as uh, the note says will throw light on affiliations and identities in the category of region and probably how they obscure social practices domination and plurality so they obscure are in a way they be the region gets integrated and we look for i think these are all important aspects so i hope uh, professor mahapatra throws light on us for the benefit of all the students and teachers and uh, hey i've heard uh, professor mahapatra on these uh, particular aspects of uh, region but i heard and read some of his poems he is a well known poet in oria as well as some of his poems are translated and uh, we had uh, we met a couple of times on um not for <clears throat> and on some fora and uh, i look forward to his talk just as most of you are thank you thank you thank you sir thank you so much uh, now i request uh, the head of the uh, school of history and the convener of this webinar series uh, dr omakant mishra sir to introduce the theme of the lecture today and also uh, briefly talk about our esteemed speaker uh, professor bishnu mahapatra sir good morning to all of you and vice chancellor esteemed speaker professor mahapatra uh, esteemed participant um, including professors academicians and like professor nivedita mantri dr prabhas singh and others i welcome you all again to the second lecture of the series on configuring regions we had an illuminating lecture yesterday by professor bp sau who spoke on the shaping of dakshina kausal what he showed yesterday is a call to change our gaze rather than treating india region as a given entity and then fill up its constituting elements through copious data historian must look into the cultural and material processes 
and chronology of the formations of cultural zones and of networks of interactions, and then further examine whether such processes, interactions, and influences lead to occurrence of historically larger spatial formations or not. He therefore cautioned against too much generalizations and essentializations. In the process of formation of larger spatial formations, there is what B.D. Chattopadhyay once told us in 96-2000 about imitable models that help us understand these processes of larger spatial formations. For example, in early historical period, Buddhism provided that model. In the post-Gupta period, Brahmanical kingship provided this imitable model. In Utkala Kalinga region, Gajapati Kingsi provided this imitable model where Ananga Bhimadeva third talked about himself as the Rauta and Lord Jagannath as the Lord of Utkala Desha in Madras Museum Copper Plate. Further, this imitable model will help us understand Khetriizations as an imitable model in the Gadajata states in 16th century. In 18th, 19th century, in the wake of you know, decline of Gajapati kingship of Puri and, you know, prestige of that, recreating Gajapati kingship in the Gadajata centers, we provided the imitable model of understanding some of the aspects of, or some of the facets of formations of spatial legion or historical legion. The image of neat regions of India or India per se, referenced speakers, their culture, social life uh, in a particular way, and concealed dominations, power on the other. This led to tensions of various kinds. Should you follow a geographer who talk of hierarchical space, such as nuclear zone, isolated zones, you know, based on natural features? rather than a homogeneous historical space, which you call as region. I must also add a caveat, whether these kind of nuclear zones, centers, should we think of one center in one time, in one space, or we should think of many centers. But the issue of region formation also is in it intertwined with the issue of language identity. It is through language that, you know, it's not a means of communications. It is, it is also understanding the life world of people who came together to form historical legions. Professor Mahapatra, who is a distinguished speaker, is is a theoretician and an academic of high order. We are very fortunate to have him today. He is a social theorist and poet, and he has taught politics for more than 25 years at the University of Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Ajim Premji University, and now in one of the leading universities, uh, which has come up as Kriya University in Tamil Nadu. He has held visiting appointments at Major the Sciences Paris, which is one of the distinguished academic sites of the world. National University of Singapore, University of Kuwait, University National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. And he has lectured in several parts of the world. Professor Mahapatra is currently senior professor, as I have already told you, and is the founding dean of School of Interwoven Arts and Sciences. He is the anchor of, for India South Asia of the World Humanities Report, supported by UNESCO and International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences, and coordinated by Council for Humanity Center and Institute University of Wisconsin-Madison. Professor 
Mahapatra has published in the area of identity politics, democracy, social capital, minorities, and host of other, you know, in relevant fields. He is currently researching on cities and the multiple imagining in his is also in the process of initiating a collective research project that seeks to understand the conceptual universe embedded in India's Bhasa literature, and therefore his worry of our term um, vernacular. Professor Mahapatra uh, has translated Pablo Neruda's poetry into Odia. He has also, uh, which is which has come out as a fragile world and was published in 2005. His latest volume of poetry in Odia, Barsa Avatara, Barsa Avatara, a meditation on rain, is wide, widely acclaimed as well. He got his big PhD, D field degree from University of Oxford and had his master's in political science from University of Delhi and MPhil from JN. In today's talk, uh, on thinking about region, its power and limit in our times, uh, he is one of the scholars who think, even he doesn't think regions in naturalistic term, and he knows that there are, these categories are inevit inevitably refracted to a complex light of imagination. And since it's refracted, the image that we have in our imagination is characterized by a certain degree of indeterminacy. This reject, the rejections of primordialism has led, him, has led many to consider region as something that is constructed like Benedict Anderson and experienced through our imaginations. We also know that, that's what I'm quoting from his abstract, that imagination is not a free floating thing in the world. A region like nation is an entrenched category of time, our time. A life spent thinking through categories has taught Professor Mahapatra to be worry of him, in worry of them. In this presentation, to explore the ways in which these categories throw light on allegiances, affiliations, and identity, and the manner in which it obscures social fractures, dominations, and pluralities. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, come and present your views. I also have requested just a small announcement. I have requested Professor Chandi Prashad Nanda, who is also ruminating on the theme and he is going to present his views on 22nd to moderate today's uh, question and answer and discussion session. Uh, and therefore I am uh, thankful to Professor Nanda and he will join us and during discussion. Then. Now I invite Professor Mahapatra to give his presentation, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I, first of all, I think I thank you all for coming. And second, I wish to offer my profound thanks to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nagaraju. I think we, our connections go a long way. And I very fondly remember my conversation in, in several conferences where we met. And, and I'm also thankful to Uma Kanta for very generous introduction and all the colleagues and students of the university and all the eminent scholars and, uh, and, 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 and eminent scholars and, 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 and discussion uh, for this uh, meeting today. I, I begin with, uh, with, with a, a small clarification, which is to say that uh, strictly speaking, um, it is not a historical uh, presentation, uh, although informed by historical perspective, one can say, uh, it is at best, according to me, an invitation to think critically about the concept of region. And it's, it's a, if I want to put it very in a provocative way, I would say that both region and nation are deeply, deeply entrenched in our times. They also appear to me, particularly region appears to me to be as, as a notion, as a, as a concept. Uh, tired and exhausted. And talking about in a different context, Nietzsche, while speaking about the value of a book, of a concept, of a musical composition, 
asked a very profound question in a rather, in a lighter vein. And that question is, can they walk? Can a concept walk? Even more, can they dance? Which is to say that when the concept get actually exhausted or they get tired, I think it is at that juncture that it is the responsibility of, of theoreticians, responsibility of, of, of people who were engaged in, 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 in thinking about uh, the concept to really work hard. And, uh, and there's no doubt that for a very long time, this concept has traveled a long distance uh, through one can say an extended tunnel of time in several continents. It's not that we are discussing about reason in, in, in Orissa or in India, they're discussed in Africa, they're discussed in uh, England, they're discussed in uh, America, they're discussed in Latin America and, and stuff like that. And it is also uh, travels through several academic disciplines, uh, including history, uh, and, and, and also travel through different kinds of ideological configurations. Uh, you can see that this has been discussed in many ways by the by the communitarians, by the liberals, by the Marxists, by the uh, postmodernists, um, by the people who are thinking about uh, identity politics, thinking about collective imaginings and, and stuff like that. So one can see that the concept for what it is, it's many incarnations, its strength, its capacity to illuminate human and social realities, its underside, its shadow, its darkness. I think that's what really we are talking about today. And we think that when the concept gets exhausted, I think we need to do something uh, about it. We really have to figure it out, uh, how to uh, inject new, new energy into it. And, and then there's also an advantage in, 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 in dealing with a concept which has this very long history, uh, kind of very strong, I would say, genealogy. And the distinction here is that when you talk about history of a concept, um, you, you assume as if this concept is actually traveling in various kinds of incarnations. When you think about the genealogy, you actually think that how the concepts are actually always connected to, to the regimes of power and, 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 and the idea of the rule and the idea of contestation and so on and so forth. So this is, there, is, this, there is an advantage of me or anybody for that matter, talking about reason in 2021. I have been discussing about it in 19, late 1980s, 90s. People are talking about it in the turn of the 20th century. People are talking about it in the late 19th centuries and, 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 and so on and so forth. And the advantage of being late is that the concept also has shown us various kinds of aspects of it, various kinds of dimensions. Uh, both political, cultural, historical, in different contexts. And that is a distinct advantage because once we know that how the concept has actually unfolded in different geographies, different continents, different disciplines, we can say something about it with, with some degree of confidence, I would submit. Uh, I, I'm reminded of, of this very, um, not only often quoted term from Hegel's philosophy of right, the preface, and Hegel really says about philosophy, that philosophy often arrives late, Hegel says. And the reason is, is that philosophy can only deal with certain realities when realities actually have traveled a distance and unfolded itself or become mature. And therefore, one of the often quoted lines from the philosopher of right in the, in, in the preface is that the, the owl of Minerva takes its flight when darkness gathers around us outside, in the sense that it's only when a concept actually traveled, unfolded, shows us, showed us many possibilities, then you can see what the concept is all about. 
what it can do and 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 where can we find its utility its relevance its limitation and and and, and stuff like that and we know like many other concepts the concept of reason is deeply contested what is being essentially what what the famous term that we have for this is called essentially contested concepts by galley if you have read galley that you know that we, we often make a distinction between concept and conceptions we have we can have one concept but you can have many conceptions for example you can have one concept of freedom but you have many conceptions of freedom in other words there are more interpretations of 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 that idea called freedom in this case you have a concept of reason but you can have many conceptions of what it means to what it what it's all about what is its what kind of territory that it covers what kind of internal resources arguments that that it marshals so and so forth so this is what is very important this is one thing to remember that there is no there's no nothing to to be gained by by saying that definitionally we agree with one idea or one concept of it. so that's not going to help us because depending on various vantages and different points of view people who tend to interpret reason in very different ways and sometimes they are uh, commensurable but sometimes they're not commensurable they they cannot be reconciled but having said that i think this there is a great great learning in, in these kind of contestations and multiple interpretations and the contested character of the concept and reason is no exception to it second there is no point in thinking about the concept and still going on a bit as a kind of preliminary that that concept is not like a mirror that metaphor according to me is not uh, adequate because conceptual thinking or elaboration is not a kind of mirroring it's not it is not it's not something what 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 the what in literature or in 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 literary theory you would call mimesis it is not a it is not a mimesis and it's absolutely not a passive mimesis it is not that you you show the mirror of concept and the reality actually reflects that i think is a very naive kind of understanding of what concepts do in 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 the, in the world the 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 idea that the 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 the, the root word for concept is concepio in latin which actually meant to grasp something it has two dimensions to that idea one is that to grasp to hold something by seeing it by uh, by examining it and the other idea is that to to get conceived to get impregnated and so there is an active and passive element when we are thinking about concepts and every concept has an object at least a core object and when you grasp when you say that you grasp an object through concept you also create something new by grasping it and so i would say that this is the kind of preliminary this is the kind of way i tend to think about concepts and 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 a reason is no exception that that you have to really look at it you have to examine it and while examining it you are actually turning it to something new so there's one dimension of this is to to driven by this kind of nuanced understanding of what conceptual thinking is all about the second which is a kind of a uh, complementary thinking is that a conceptual thinking ought to be done hand in hand with uh with with what i call driven by questions because sometimes when you tend to be driven entirely by concept uh you do not come up with 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 a complex analysis of what you are trying to understand in this case of course reason but when you are driven by both by concepts and questions there is a likelihood that you actually produce a far more synthetic 
an interesting understanding of the problem. For example, in case of regions, what kind of questions we have? What kind of questions have been produced or thought about uh, in the past? These questions, for example, uh, people when think about region would always be curious to know how did it emerge? People would ask, what are the, if, if region is always intrinsically connected with human thinking about identity and, and, and collectivity? Third, how, what kind of imaginings are involved when people think about collectivities? Are there in significant shifts in history from one period of time in history to another period? Is there something called truly a modern conception or a conception which presented to us in the, in the due process of modernity and modern developments? Here are kind of, there can be many other questions depending on what questions you ask. So what I, what I advocate is actually, as they say, uh, walking on two legs. One, of course, a deep, complex understanding of conceptual resources that you have. And second, the questions that you pose, the questions that you, the questions that, that, that drive, your, uh, drive your intellectual exercise. Yesterday, when um, uh, uh, Professor Bhairavi Sahu spoke about uh, historical perspective, a historical perspective uh, of, 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 a, of a long historical perspective, uh, encapsulating centuries of experiences and institutions and interactions, and perhaps disjunctures and stuff like that. There's only one perspective that one can get that how interactive things were when regions were kind of coming into being, if I can use that expression. Or people are thinking that something is happening and new stuff is emerging, new relationship is emerging, and new, new interactions are emerging and stuff like that. Very important perspective, very valuable insights. But what I want to submit at this point is that if we want to understand region properly, if you understand the significant dimensions of, of this, we have no escape from a kind of multidisciplinary kind of approach to this issue or to this idea. That because there's no single discipline, according to me, can do justice to the multidimensionality multi of, of, of the idea of region. So you can, think, you, can, you can think of historical perspective as a constitutive idea where that, that everything is actually kind of filtered through history or everything is kind of history has entered through every other ways of thinking. That's one way of thinking about it. But otherwise I would submit that we need for a better understanding, a critical understanding of region, we need a lot of interweaving to happen. Interweaving among disciplines. You can see geographers thinking about region. You can think historians are thinking about region. You think political theorists are thinking about region. You have literary theorists are thinking about region. You have writers, poets, novelists are thinking about region. You have politicians, politics, administrators, constitutional make, constitution makers, guys who are thinking about law and stuff like that, also thinking about reason. And, and therefore, depending on the questions, depending on the dimensions that we want to explore, I think I would submit that it is necessary, I think inevitably, that we, we have to be multidisciplinary in a, in a, in a meaningful sense. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to 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 make sense of it. Uh, for example, you can't make sense of the symbolic resources uh, that that have been used to think about region without really the help of 
you know, whether it's anthropology, whether it is uh, the kind of philosophical and literary understanding of how symbols work, how do they articulate things, uh, what, how do they, uh, how do they marshal their internal uh, resources and stuff like that. So it's very important that we we become truly multidisciplinary when it comes to thinking about uh, reason. It's a not that it is not that 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 we are saying it in in 2021. Uh, this has been felt for a very long time. I was actually looking at uh, a lecture given by an Oxford geographer almost 60 years ago at uh, London School of Economics as a part of what is called the Herbertson Memorial Lecture. And the lecture was actually on the idea of reason, on the, on the idea of collective living. And, uh, and, 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 and the geographer, uh, uh, Professor Gilbert, spoke about three kinds of regions or three ideas emerging at three sites, you can say. One, of course, his own discipline, geography, the how people are speaking about natural geography, people are talking about regional geography. What is the state of play in England? What are they doing in its name? Right from the beginning of the 20th century. And he was also talking about how literary stuff, whether it is uh, novels, uh, poetry, uh, and other literary genres were reflecting the, 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 the idea of the, of the region, the interconnectedness, the values, the, the landscape. And of course, we, I mean, he spoke about Thomas Hardy, spoke about D.H. Lawrence, uh, spoke about, so this is, again, you know, and he, towards the end, he, he, his pleading, of course, to, to, because this is speaking to geographers, he's saying that it is really important that we have to think of region from, from a multidisciplinary perspectives, but don't think of it as, as a kind of, you know, in a positivistic way of really grasping it for all time to come, but think more like a poet. Thought that the, the poet's way of looking at it may help geographers to produce a better understanding of, of reason and stuff like that. He also reflected a little on the, uh, the, the issues of regional aspiration in England and, and stuff like that. And also there is one bit of interesting um, snippet in that, in, that, in that lecture was that while thinking about uh, uh, Cambridge and Oxford, he wanted to find out where does the, how does the reason is kind of formed surrounding a city and where does the boundary end or what is the extent of that, that region? And, 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 and one interesting empirical point that he makes that they thought of the newspapers and they thought of the circulation of the newspapers. If the newspaper, the local newspapers go to certain extent, they thought that that's where the, perhaps the boundary of that region uh, uh, was at that given point in time. So this is a way in which, you know, for, for a very long time, people have been thinking about a region for various different vantage points and and we have to really think of what is the what is the kind of our history in which we have been thinking about it there are three points i want to make about that that what is what is our preoccupation with this question uh, and 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 what is the what is the what is the constellation of concepts or ideas in which region appears one of course the dominant one, according to me, is about then the narrative of nation, state, and power. We saw yesterday in yesterday's presentation how state um, was significant. We also saw power was significant. We also saw that there are certain ways in which these ideas were combined. And when different contiguous regions were trying to think of their interconnections at a time when the royal power was the driving force or royal power was the locus of that thinking, uh, if not exclusively, but at least the dominant part of that thinking. 
was done. So you could see, but over a period of time, those ways of thinking about reason and its connection with, with power, and now of course in, in, in our time, nation, had changed. That, in fact, is the single important uh, problematic of our times. That, and let me just clarify a bit about it, because I think, you know, often when we think about the modern character of, of the way we think about reason, think about regional identities or aspirations or politics or articulations, it's modern variant, it's modern character. We have gone to, it's quite likely that it's possible that we can go to the other extreme. That, you know, the, so therefore, when I was researching in the 1980s about, about collective identity and Orissa and stuff like that, just an auto critique that it was because there's so much of the writing, common sense was pushing us to look at in a kind of seamless way how identities have evolved to history that we had to necessarily revolt, necessarily critique it and say, and emphasize more on the disjuncture, more on, on how things are different, how, how the question of regional identity or question of regional aspiration or question of language and other things acquire a very modern kind of, you can say, hue or you can say color during the, 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 the period that we're discussing, let's say 19th century or even the colonial period. It's almost, I would say that because we are reacting against that kind of common sense, sometimes as a pure reflex, pure contextual thinking that sometimes we went to the other extreme by saying that this is something modern. You cannot say that identity is one thing that is actually flowing through or floating in, in a tunnel of time uh, in the same way. It is one object and which is actually going through time. No, that's, I think that we thought metaphor was deeply uh, or historical, deeply uh, problematic uh, and didn't really alert us to the to the, to, the, to the modern variant of this, which actually is coming up in a completely different form. So having said that, I think what we did, we emphasized on the disjuncture. We emphasized on what it means to think about region in the time of, of, of colonialism, of time of, of a different way of thinking about, <laughs> different way of thinking about nation, collectivity, uh, so this is what really, and what we, with what, what I think what we legitimately and rightly thought that the world is not, the world is not the same anymore. You are actually thinking about uh, identity politics. You're thinking about nation. You're thinking about collectivities at a time when things have really changed. So it has changed, obviously changed significantly from what Professor Sahu was describing. The, the, the idea of the state were changing, the idea of sovereignty were changing, the, the idea of nation was kind of, you know, the, the, the 19th century has, has it's kind of emerging in, in, in very different ways. Our understanding of it was, and also the kind of modern technology, modern practices, whether, I mean, we they're often talked about it, whether it's enumeration, whether it is the uh, new statecraft, whether it is, you know, uh, certain ways of thinking about uh, uh, identity, politics, and, and, and autonomy, and, and stuff like that. So we emphasized on the, the modern nature of, 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 of this formation. And, and that actually, Serve the purpose in the in the beginning by as as a critique as a new way of thinking about it, and once we did that, this is again auto critique that we 
realized that the reality of, of thinking about region is far more nuanced and far, far more complex than to think purely in terms of what was in the past and what appears in the time we describe as modern. And in fact, there are enduring structures. There are subterranean ways of thinking and feeling that can really travel in society for a very long time. They, of course, don't travel in the same way. They don't appear in the same way, but you can still, still see the traces of it. You can still see the elements for which you can say that this actually is an older vintage rather than completely new. So, so this is where the, the present scholarship about it is to really, nobody thinks that the, the modernity of, 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 of thinking about region and, and identity and nation uh, has to be seen completely at, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a clinical separation between earlier times. People now see, while recognizing the irreducible nature of, 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 of the presence of modern, it is possible to see the lingering or, or the presence of the enduring old structures and thinking. And that's one of the reasons why today, if I'm thinking about that, of course, I, 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 when I wrote subsequently, I was far more sensitive to that. In the beginning, I was in, 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 a, in, a, in a far more polemical way thought that it is the, the, the disjuncture I said has to emphasize. Later on, I think we thought that no, there are, you know, and that's one of the reasons why you find works subsequently thought of that uh, is kind of, as they called the long durée, the thinking about in, a, in, the, in the long, long-term thinking about, about these things, whether it is the work of Belchiri and Aran Rao, whether it is the Cynthia Talbots, whether it is, you know, there are many, people who brought in, there are certain pre-colonial elements of thinking about collectivity, thinking about identity, which we thought really essential and useful. And they cannot be just rejected thinking that, oh, the period of tradition or that period is over and human societies actually have made a clean break with the tradition and now entering into the realm of modern. That actually is, is, is not, not historically true, and, but this is very different thing to say that identity, the way we experience in modern times is the same thing that happened in, in 17th century or 16th century and stuff like that. So then the question arises, the language in which we thought about these things. One, of course, the language which remained still very powerful is the language of historicness or the primordiality in the sense that we, there is one idea that actually resists historicizing it. We know, you know, when people think about, when in an ordinary conversation, when people say, when it happened, you say, oh, it's long, long time ago. What you're saying, you're actually, for certain reasons, it is uh, not difficult to analyze, is that you are actually resisting a certain degree of historicization, unless you have a very different way of, ways of thinking about past. Uh, there are certain ways of historicizing you are resisting it. And that element, that primordial, primordial thinking, that the thinking that, that identities are, have really existed for a very long time, and, 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 and it's only that we are re-experiencing it in any way, is, is a very powerful idea. And one has to really understand that why is it that this resisting the historicization and, 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 and continuation of, of certain primordial thinking, certain thinking that we are temporal, we are, uh, we are ephemeral, but our identity is eternal or, or, or the land is eternal, is, is an idea that needs critical reflection. One way, of one way of really thinking about it is to see that this primordiality, this way of registering history has, is deeply located in a particular kind of politics to see that what, what in the sense, because of the, because of the idiom in which people started articulating demands, thinking about collective identities, people tend to use that language, that language becomes so dominant that today people don't question it. For example, 
when people thought that if you, if you belong to a particular kind of race, particular kind of group, you have every right to rule yourselves is an idea which has its own historical time. But when it became dominant, you see, which is an entrenched idea in our times for good reason, and also it's a good thing that it is, it is, is entrenched, some of these ideas. But think about it when, when people started thinking that this is what is the natural way of thinking about the world. It is not a natural way of thinking about the world. When people started saying that, oh, we are X, therefore we deserve Y, then that, that X and Y can be very different. And there is a, there's a time when it came that certain identity and connection with your own rule and your autonomy and politics became quite a kind of collective common sense across the world. So people thought of using that as, as an idiom. This ancientness of your race, the ancientness of your past became an idiom for not only consolidating who you are, but also for claim making, for making claims, for, for sharpening differences, for consolidating your inner resources. So it, it, depending on where, what you are looking at, you would find there are multiple political vantage points from which these things are worked out. Take for instance, when people said that, 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 that Odia language, for example. These are, these arguments are still being played out, even even now in, in, in various places, including in Odisha. This that that we are, we can push back the history of our language to either six, seven centuries or ten century, depending on uh, what materials you're looking at. And 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 certain proto, what becomes a proto is also a strategy of claim making. And, and this claim making was only one part. So when you, in a colonial dispensation, if you wanted to really describe things, you have to really bring, you have to really, because that sense of ancientness of things and the importance of history became then extremely important. And that's one of the reasons why certain ways of thinking about yourself, who you are, through the greed of history has become important and whenever people didn't, they didn't have that, they felt a sense of lack. And that's what when Bankim had to say that, look, everybody had history, including the Odias, but Bengalis are not really, don't care much about history. Why would you feel a certain sense of lack or a certain sense of humiliation just because you don't have history? It was not, the lack of history was not seen as, as a lack. For, for a very long time. So there was a time when, when once this thinking comes into being, once they become, as they, it's not an elegant term, but once they become modular, once they became things that has a form, this, 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 this created a new form. This a new, created a new form of thinking, aligning things, summing up issues, marshalling resources, ordering them, filtering them out, obscuring few things, throwing light on some, allowing the shadows to linger in others is very important. So that's the constellation when its reason appears and still continues to be in our time. It's very difficult to imagine that in our, in our present context without really thinking about power, autonomy, demand, nation, and, and stuff like that. The second, which I think is the, is the identity and belongingness. And the third one is the invisibility and loss. They're the three central conundrums. With every way of thinking about it, there is a conundrum. There is a, as they would call it, you would, you would reach a dead end. You would, you would have certain unresolved issues. You have certain things that you, that you, uh, uh, that you, that, that you have to work out. Take, for instance, in late 19th century and early day, late 20th centuries, uh, the, 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 the literate Odias in newspapers and in, in petitions in their own advocacy of, of, of the language issue and, 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 and the irredentism or the, the, the aspiration to unify territories was done by harping on two ways of thinking about the territory. One, of course, is the, what they described as Prakritika Utkala, 
and the other one is called rajanaitik kala you may actually find they are not always elaborated in greater detail they are not doing a conceptual exercise they were really making they are using a language which is actually by the by the time has becoming common place or at least being understood and what was the prakritika utkala meant prakritika utkala meant is not like natural geography for geographers which is which meant without people geography you know the land the vegetation the water the mountains and so on as if they exist independently but here in this case it is it is a territory inhabited by people for a very long time there's a naturalness of people and territory there is a there is a uh, so this is where the prakritika utkala was seen as as something which kind of default this is something seen as and what was seen the opposite of it is the rajanaitika utkala what is the rajanaitika utkala rajanaitika utkala is is the is the is the way these territories are subjected to or reorganized in the light of the current politics or administrative compulsions or by the colonial state and stuff like that or what it is in the in the in the in this so there was in in you can say there was an attempt in, in that understanding of fusing negating the rajanaitik utkal and seeing how the more and more of prakritik utkal can really coincide with rajanaitik i think it was i think very uncanny resemblance of what really kelner was talking about you know in 1980s in nations and nationalism how he wanted to make politics and culture congruent that that's the driving force of nationalism and 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 this is something which was happening this is kind of category in which people are thinking about the other for example uh, if one were to think for example there is you know there, there was when people are trying again in 20th century to find out who is actually an odia who who should be who should be that checked because after all much of these regional aspirations and thinking also produce a certain kinds of subjectivity there's no time to talk about it but that that's a very interesting area of work that they're not merely producing politics and politics is also a way of producing subjectivity in the subjectivity in the sense that what you think about yourself what kind of connection that you see as legitimate or illegitimate and stuff like that so in in the utkala sammelani for example some of the thing people would say anybody who lives in this territory is an odia okay second who else anybody who looks look at the generic sense in which people are trying to define you can see that why it's a generic sense people who think about the welfare of orissa is an odia it's neither here nor there what is the who thinks of the welfare and where is the issue of language where is the issue of differentiate where is the so you could see you know different ways in which these were really um, floating and made because the the the, the there's, a, there's a historical reason why the certain claim making has to adopt certain languages and what i call as a kind of pattern of weak mobilization because some of these mobilizations are not been found by huge amount of confidence in 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 material and organizational resources so therefore you had to really make things appear very different argue in in different ways and and stuff like that now this and and this kind of way of thinking that, that, that affiliation your sense of belongingness at a time when there are new ways of thinking about time new ways of thinking about culture appearing the print appearing uh, different kind of commodities are flow of commodities ideas and and people are thinking about the dialectic of the region and nation and that process according to me is still unfolding in various parts of the country including odisha a good example of it is to to see that why odisha government in 2020 thought of really creating a state song that song existed antakavi lakshmiwan mahapatra bande utkala janani existed in 1990 if you look at uh, Uh, South, southern indian states karnataka has the other uh, poem by kuempu tamil nadu there many states have this not all many states have state songs 
why suddenly in 2020, government of Orissa or thinking the political dispensation is still, in other words, what I'm to say, I want to submit that some of these processes are still on in, in, a, in, a, in a very different, in, in other words, those resources have still not been exhausted politically, but it has also created its own uh, thing. For example, when you think about Orissa as a territory, you know, what, you know, I had a very interesting, how do you describe it? How do, how do you, uh, you know, when the, the Mayurban state was finally included, finally brought in, the issues of boundaries, for example, you know, there is a question in, 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 in Bhairavi's kind of rendering of that history. There are frontiers, but they're not necessarily turned into strict boundaries. It's only in the, in the modern times when states actually have those kind of very strict boundaries, you have a modern problems in the sense, because boundaries can never, boundaries can never cut off. Boundaries is essentially a place where a lot of mixing happens, a lot of overlapping happens. And it is only in these areas, therefore, because mixing happens, different linguistic groups, different ethnic groups always try to claim this as theirs. And that politics in India hasn't exhausted itself as yet. It was still claiming, Karnataka is still claiming things from Maharashtra, Maharashtra is still claiming their arts. Tamil Nadu and Andhra still, Andhra and Telangana would have it. Bengal and Orissa would already have it. Bengal and Bihar would have it. You know, so so Bengal and Ganjam, sorry, Bengal and sorry, Orissa and, and Andhra would have it. So they, they are kind of not adjusted so far because of the nature of the state and nature of boundaries and stuff like that. In other words, the identity politics actually brought in a lot many dimensions. And, and we use in social science a term called overdetermined. It was overdetermined in, in some sense because people, the elites who wanted to consolidate their own position, identity politics came handy. That, that ensured that there's some kind of leadership in a weak material position, but to claim a certain ideological leadership, it was important to challenge and contest it and so on. But as a group, it helped them to consolidate. There are people who wanted to look up your jobs language, defense of language is also defense of, 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 of jobs, defense of material uh, conditions and, 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 and so on. Similarly, you find people are talking about that affiliation. I think that takes again, very different. I'm deeply interested in those kind of questions, how, how identity questions create affect, create certain sense of affiliation and how that affiliation is actually produced. And when Anderson wrote uh, imagine communities where, where imagination is not means uh, that there there are uh, there are there are, are faults or there are lies or they're uh, fabricated. They can be fabricated, but but I'm saying they're not necessarily mean they they're imagined. But how they imagine? How are they imagine? What is the nature of that imagination? And often Anderson's first edition of Imagine Communities often talked about the imagination in the apprehension of time. It's only in the second edition that Anderson complemented the apprehension, new ways of apprehending time with the new ways of apprehending space. And that's why the, the chapter on census map. And, and, and we know in the colonial history, there's a lot of work on what really map did, what enumeration did, what census did, what museumization did, uh, what museums do usually, what representation do, what you represent Orissa as. What do you represent Orissa as is still an, an unresolved. It is still an ongoing, I think for me, it will always remain unresolved because what will happen in its own imagination, there'll be always something which remains not so central. For example, if you look at uh, the sheer way to geographically to conceptualize the, the, the land, you can say that it has had Mughal Bandi, it has the Garjat area, it has the entire areas of, of Adivasi communities in a big chunk and small kingdoms, of course, that's the Garjat. And, and these areas, you know, you can see in terms of very distinct geographies, political geographies, and see how, how they would mingle and then so forth. If you look at purely from the, from the point of view of 
uh, from the language. I think the, the, as I said, the questions are still, you know, that's again the point that Gellar made, that nationalism always wanted to make the culture the high culture. And you can see that the making Odia language or arguing for it and getting it by the state as a classical language, it's of the same order of the same kind that, that but what really happens in the, in the language politics? I had a very interesting conversation in the 1990s with uh, uh, Prayag that uh, uh, was in Khadiyal, Joshi. And he, it was about language. And he, when I used the term Sambalpuri language, they quickly changed. He told me that, look, you are not using the right term. I said, what is the social? I said, yes, fair enough, it's good. And so he had described to me that what that language so there is, so it is sometimes futile to say that one is a language, one is a dialect. And we know, I think it's an important uh, uh, kind of statement made uh, that, 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 you know, kind of dialect is a language, an army, you know, so something like that. In the sense that this distinction between what is a dialect for language is always, every, 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 everything is a language. And what really has happened in India, which is the point that I want to make an end, which is the option, the, 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 just one more point before I end, is that, you know, this idea that what really gets obscured, what, who gets, what gets obscured, what gets the center stage, and there is an unfinished business about it, there is still contestation, and why language should be described as dialect, um, uh, how things will become how you acknowledge, how you, how the politics of use Charles Taylor's phrase politics of recognition can be, can be done legitimately in sense of justice and dignity is a very important question in most states, including Orissa. Because you can't, because one way of really the, 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 the thing that everybody has to autonomy, according to me, I submit always, is a central principle on the basis of which these things can be worked out. Not necessarily just have another state, but autonomy. Real autonomy is the key principle. Autonomy is the key principle of, 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 of thinking about these questions. And because language, we know that how many languages in this country are dying. I had a very different view when I was thinking about the linguistic minorities in this country. I thought that India has handled its kind of linguistic minorities and that issue pretty well. It's only the religious minorities we have problems with or uh, seems to be have problems, but, but the language issue we have handled our issue, but not necessarily the case. When Ganesh Devi came and told that there are hundreds of languages are dying. And, and we could see that the dialectic between the region and nation, that, that and sanctified by, by a federal constitution, also has its own darker side. It's only the dominant groups and languages who, and we know that why, what really federalism does, what it does that create a majority out of a minority. When, the, when there's a larger state, there are many minorities by creating a new state, you create a majority out of a minority. That's you handle. There's a lot of kind of way you manage those things and so forth. Resulting from that, so always comes the identity politics of thinking about region. Is what is this idea? Is the region politics in the name of language and culture is actually a kind of ruse? Is a kind of deception? It's all about actually promoting certain interests. People might say certain interests of the capital, certain interest of the class, certain interest, you know, to see, like in the colonial period, that people saw nationalism. I don't necessarily subscribe to it, although interests are always fused in, 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 in all these narratives. But what is, what is important is not to reduce every collective affiliation and belonging to what I think uh, I called in my essay as belly politics. That I think ordinary people are incapable of thinking about language and, and identity and culture. And it's only the educated people are able to only think about who they are. And then, so, so, and then in, 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 a, in a different context, I think borrowing from another author, Tapan Rachaudhri, called it as animal politics. I think that we should 
avoid because there are more complicated and complex explanation as to how different classes come to affiliate themselves for different reasons and with different points of view and stuff like that. And what finally, to who remains visible and who remains invisible? Who is acknowledged? Who is not acknowledged? These are not, these are unresolved questions. There are ongoing questions everywhere in the world. The more we see, the more we are attentive to, 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 the, to the other side of the identity politics, to the, to the other side of conceptualizing regions, to see its darker territories, to see it that, that, that what it obscures is an making an advance meant as far as the concept of region is concerned. Otherwise they became, they will become like often they are, uh, are the instruments of power. And, and if some people say, if nation can be hegemonic, so can be the region. And, and so therefore to see, to see it, to, to, um, uh, to, to think about the, 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 the political economy of affiliation the, are, are extremely important along with that what really, who gets, what gets eclipsed, what, what gets obscured, what remains invisible. I think that's the most important thing. I think often our imagination, I must say the last point, often the imagination is often remained within the horizon of state power, I must say. And, and this is our modern, but, but history or human situations don't have to be always written purely from the point of view of We saw that from the Pot war on people who are not governed, or those who don't want to be covered. There may be few people here and there, but you could see much of our stuff that we write about nation and region, our affiliations and so on, we shot through with that, 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 that question of power and so on and so forth. It produces certain things, it obscures a lot. It also creates a habit in our imagination, our thinking about it. And, and sometimes our critical thinking is all about breaking our habits of thinking, making something which will appear as natural, not so natural. See, and this only then we can find the existing horizon of thinking can perhaps change a bit. And I would stop here and thank you very much. Prabhat Singh, sir, please mute, mute your audio. Now, I, now there are many provocative, provocative questions. Uh, and I request uh, Professor Gyanaranjan Swai. And before that, uh, I also request um, Professor Chandi Prasadananda to initiate discussion on many of the provocative ideas that SAR has put before us, like the overdetermined issue of identity, invisibility and loss, and then issues of identity and belongingness, and moreover, you know, the newness, as well as the oldness of this close relationship between nation, state, and power. Because, you know, as he says, the resources have not been exhausted. And in those slides, I, you know, because Professor Nanda is also ruminating on the issue, I request uh, Professor Chandi Nanda to initiate the discussion. And uh, the kind of questions that have come up are broadly related to uh, the conceptual categories that we have and their uh, tonality, their texture, as well as their durations. Then about issue of body identity or other sub-regional identity, and then you know marginalizations of other groups of people, including Adivas. Third question is: Has the language issue become defunct in the last twenty years of neoliberalization? And then uh, the issue of how in the last 25 years, the issue of language has gone to a back burner, 
has gone to back burner and issue of development has come to post for ground uh, these are the broad questions that have come up on the chat box uh, but you know to take it further both the discussion as well as the questions that have been posed i request professor chandi prashanand who is the professor in the department of history of ensa university uh, to take on along with professor gyanaranjan swain of political science department of gm university thank you so much thank you uh, dr misra for this uh, invitation and uh, thank you professor mahapatra uh, it's uh, great seeing you after a long time uh, formally as professor mahapatra but very intensely as bishnu bhai uh, i mean i mean nothing could have been more productive than those uh, you know very powerful and uh, thought uh, powered with lot of ideas you know power, power, powered with a uh, lot of insights to have this intervention in terms of saying that uh, concept can have a life world but it has its also it has its own limits saying that as you the way you started saying that uh, concept get exhausted that's uh, that is how it alerts all of us as social scientists to look at it very closely and that's why you said that uh, it's really uh, it's a kind of invitation that this uh, uh, colloquium on uh, thinking through region could be a real dialogue to think through some of these ideas very nuanced ideas uh, on how do we frame our imaginations i mean you're right saying that uh, uh, concept really entails multiple imaginations multiple conceptions and when somebody looks at your own work of uh, the, as you rightly said 1980s and 90s you have been drawn into this particular theme uh, when you came up with your fantastic work on kanchika religion and for the first time you brought in a kind of rupture to a kind of very uh, conventional understanding of looking at regions and question of identity and uh, provoked the you know uh, readers of history or provoked provoked the practitioners of history in terms of uh, you know looking at this question from a different uh, perspective altogether as you now also trying to uh, underscore this point by saying that it needs a multidisciplinary approach precisely because of the fact that uh, region could be a multi dimensional reality and of course uh, uh, very clearly that one has to i mean a critical social scientist cannot simply remain content with this idea of you know understanding region nation in terms of status discourse and uh, uh, the the kind of ideas that you uh, worked on right since 90s that how do we frame our imagination in terms of uh, uh, you know at least trying to uh, at least uh, trying to identify these elements of belongingness these elements which form this uh, concept called cultural identity and where you try to also relate it to uh, this question of uh, cultural identity with the politics of recognition and democracy something like that uh, my way of you know trying to uh, look at uh, uh, this question would be uh, i mean just i mean taking a lot of uh, uh, insights from your own talk would be to put in uh, i i'm trying to emphasize on these two aspects uh, you rightly said that historical perspective could be a dominant perspective could be one of those perspectives through which we need to look at the question of uh, identity uh, and the question of cultural identity but there has to be other perspectives but at the same time uh, when we tend to understand history as a kind of understanding which is produced around the understanding of the patterns of structures of past is one aspect of i mean making sense of history the other sense could be like that patterns of structures of historians narrations of the past I and mean, this aspect which is the latter one is more important i mean to bring into view uh, at least bring into relief 
the kind of ideas that you talked about, uh, uh, saying that uh, we need to look at these ideas of continuity, these junctures, question of contestations, power, and everything. So now this has been, I mean, at this, when we talk about this, something which also inevitably leads us to think about uh, some ideas which have come up and being discussed in the literature, saying that subaltern past. Uh, these past cannot be simply a, have a kind of narrative uh, principles of narration. Uh, the way social science has uh, come to, uh, you know, subscribe to it, like, like, like saying that uh, social science or part of it is history has a particular way of narrating the past, uh, relating to the past, detailing its past. But subaltern past basically tries to talk about the uh, narrative principles which might defy those standard norms, those standard canonical, you know, uh, discursive terms. And in that way, uh, we need different ways of imagining. Uh, for example, uh, the question of agency comes, for example, when we try to relate to a multiple conception of the past in the context of, uh, you know, figuring out our cultural identity, when we try to, as you rightly say, that we need to talk about DTs, uh, and destitution, landscapes, and everything. And your own turn in your own life, from a social scientist to a poet or, or a kind of a person who is more oriented to literature these days, itself speaks about a kind of uh, uh, you know life world where you think that uh, these categories, uh, which have been very provocative as part of uh, doing social science has really proved itself. I mean, really need to be declared as uh, though indispensable or also at the same time inadequate. So if that uh, idea, you know, provokes you inside and you look for other conceptual resources to figure out this question, this new imaginary, then uh, what is important is to, uh, is to also uh, think about the question of agency. For example, uh, when we talk about our own cultural resources in terms of, you know, deities, uh, you know, uh, gods, spirits, non-human beings as part of our landscape, as a part of our, you know, uh, past, which was uh, full of gods and spirits, then whether these elements can be also uh, seen as having a kind of presence like a, this can be treated as having agential presence. That is the question that also uh, comes to mind. And how these subaltern past also continue to exist, as you rightly said, that uh, when we try to think of a modern uh, question uh, over and around the question, uh, concept of cultural identity, I mean, this is a modern, if we try to, I mean, all uh, bring in all the uh, elements of modernity to figure out this uh, question of cultural identity, whether something medieval, something ancient also overflows into this, uh, into the constitution of this particular element called uh, cultural identity. Uh, I think uh, these are the two posers that I would like to uh, submit before you. And I know that uh, you have a very fabulous uh, imaginary frame to bring these things in. Uh, what I'm trying to basically talk about that when we try to talk of uh, cultural identity, question of cultural identity, when we try to engage with this question, uh, some of the very nuanced ideas of minority history, subaltern past, or what has been called history too, needs to be brought in, uh, uh, in dialogue with, and also in contestation with what we have understood as history proper, as the uh, something like that. When I said history, I don't mean only history as a uh, discipline with its very robust protocols, but also I mean the entire range of imaginary that is included within the domain of social science. So that's for the moment uh, I'd submit before you, but very uh, interesting questions have come up and as Uma has already, you know, tried to, uh, you know, sum up these questions. Uh, these are uh, some kind of foods for thought and I, I, I invite you to uh, you know, uh, uh, more of uh, uh, your understanding uh, on these aspects uh, you can share uh, so that it be more uh, productive for all of us. Thank you. 
thank you chandi uh, umakan do you think i respond now to chandi's this thing or sir can i say a few words yeah yeah okay so why not you two uh, two three people speak and then i respond and then uh, yeah, yeah. thank you thank you uh, first of all um, i mean it's uh, i mean wonderful uh, presentation and uh, knowing professor mahapatra uh, i mean his ideas and the way he articulates his ideas i mean uh, wonderfully constructed ideas uh, but you no know, we are, we all are students of uh, politics and uh, we look at the questions that you have raised particularly the way uh, you have framed the idea of regions and some subregions but uh, <clears throat> i have you know um, um, i mean quite uh, i mean a couple of things uh, i mean you can say these are observations or uh, you can say i mean these are just uh, my own uh, understanding of uh, i mean the key things that you said uh, today see first of all when we think about uh, identities and particularly you also mentioned about it particular how liberals and communitarians they uh, try to accommodate the question of identity in different ways but i think uh, the identity question uh, is still a unresolved question and particularly when we look at the indian constitution and the way it has tried to address the question of identity in forms of i mean in terms of uh, formulating um, particularly regions uh, on the basis of language you also mentioned about it i think uh, the idea of creating states on the basis of language has its own limitations and i mean even till today um, we are also facing this same kind of problems and also one of the key i mean um, one of the participants who also asked the same question particularly uh, sen gupta he has written uh, you know in his book he actually uh, some uh, i mean mentions some interesting points uh, that uh, you know that uh, identity question particularly based on language is a uh you know something uh, that uh, we need not highlight so much rather we should highlight some of the i mean um uh, key uh, you know uh, development questions uh, that's an interesting observation but what uh, appeals to me uh, two things is that first uh, when we construct the idea of a region and sub regions why we sometimes fail to recognize you know uh, and particularly in a constitutional framework a role of political parties and the uh, political leaders uh, i mean uh, we sometimes we actually emphasize on language we emphasize on religion we emphasize on uh, you know um, other factors but we actually uh, forget to involve i mean the deeply involved political leaders and personalities involved in the formation of these kind of identities so i think this one aspect maybe we can add to our explanation about the regions and uh, regionalism the second thing uh, i mean when you actually spoke about very correctly you uh, i mean i mean you spoke about the idea of who can be called as an odia and the question of odia identity uh, you know i also have a very particular uh, you know um, i mean i have my own opinions and maybe this is an addition to uh, what you say is that you know uh, why uh, the question of uh, odia identity right it has not uh, you know uh, manifested in a very uh, violent way particularly if you look at uh, i mean sorry to say this but we know when people who stayed in delhi they know that uh, bihari identities um, you know uh, western up identity i mean there are many uh, you know sub region identities but i feel compared to that odia identity is not actually that uh, you know violent in terms of you know you know we have many uh, dimensions to uh, this question but i think i will add add two things to this whole uh, problem of odia identity i mean why uh, even within odisha also um, i mean first of all um, i would like to subscribe to the view that you rightly said those who belong i mean those who stay within the regions of odisha they actually are uh, people i mean odia people this is the um, you know um, point i subscribe to i mean you also mentioned about it even particularly the utkala samelani um, point of view but i think what actually uh, is 
you know responsible for uh, you know not uh, you know that um, uh, why that uh, i think two things i will uh, i will attribute first is that you know uh, when we look at uh, the uh, history of odisha's freedom struggle i mean deep involvement of uh, you know uh, odisha in the freedom struggle and actually you know uh, so never the question of you know any kind of sub regional identities it has allowed to emerge okay and also the prajamandal movement these two things are very important and uh, um, you know in addition to that these two things also contributed not to the emergence of any kind of you know identity based politics uh, based on uh, you know your uh, you know caste um, particularly dalits and adivasis so uh, this prajamandal movement and deep involvement in the freedom struggle actually created a kind of uh you know uh, odisha hegemony i would like to say so i think so this uh, so these are all deeply political questions and it can be um, you know contested but uh, these are uh, i think uh, but we need to consider these uh, questions uh, when we really think about regions and regionalism so but uh, yeah, honestly may speaking may interrupt you yeah. may interrupt you because there are a lot of questions which have come and you know due to be you know I'm, I'm finished. Yeah, I'm finished. I'm done. Done. I'm done. Don't take those questions, Sam. No, there is a questions that has come from a learned audience who has also uh, who uh, who talks about whether the concept that we use, uh, such as region, is concept not related to an object. Can we create concept without an object? Uh, you know, it's all about well, Aristotelian categories. Uh, that he talks of uh, he might also come and directly pose this question uh, i request him to do so because um, but we need to be very brief uh, therefore the question that he asks whether concept has concrete form or concept can operate in imaginable merely constructions uh, abstract concepts the second issue that has come up let me summarize this how is this odia irredentism led to marginalization like the pushpa talks up how has this unilateral language resulted in the marginalization so third issue that has come up in the chat box i must raise this because um, otherwise there is no meaning of this um, discussion the third issue is about how has in the neo liberalization period language has not been an issue because we know that dr nabin patnaik ji who is a chief minister doesn't speak good odia and they say that you know a different kind of language has emerged how do we map out this language and then about issues of how identity how identity is closely related to hegemony and marginalization which you have already spoken of thank you very much sir. and uh, i am i would uh, request you to answer these questions and then uh, professor our vice chancellor uh, would uh, also have his views uh, but please uh, uh, please should go I, ahead should i should i answer now makan Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. I think thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Chandi and thank you to Gyana. They, they, uh, they dear friends. And I find the questions, uh, Umakant, even your questions are deeply. Uh, there are deep significance to the questions that you all have asked. I don't think I'll be able to can able to do justice in a very short period of time. i want to say two things to to what uh, chandi was saying i fully agree the last bit uh, essay that i wrote on this issue of history i make always distinction between academic history writing and uh, there are other ways of thinking about the past and i always say that uh, uh, history is a small island in the ocean of thinking about the past uh, but that island is the powerful island and 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 therefore i agree with you that you know there is a need to think about uh, different ways of accessing our past and sometimes our methodologies are the create the obstacles 
a bring plus for us. The more we um, moderate them or we critique them, then we will be able to make sense of the past in a far more nuanced ways and far more complex and far more, I would say, even richer ways. And so therefore, the question about what constitutes the part, the, the meta-historical questions, the, the historiographical questions, not merely what the content, what goes in the name of history, but after all, what constitutes history? What, what remains the, 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 the relevant knowledge? Because after all, uh, when social scientists and historians or literary theorists, we defend our own ways of thinking and writing, there is a conflict of interest because always we try to defend what we're doing because it's our bread and butter. And I always tell my friends that, look, there's always a conflict of interest when I'm defending a uh, study of politics, saying that, look, the actual study of politics happens in the political science departments or the centers of politics. But there are a lot of people who are outside who say that, no, not at all. You may be doing something worthwhile, or the historians are doing worthwhile, but there are also a large body of knowledge which is actually produced in the realm of society. And to, to not to engage with them by screening them out, in, in other words, would be unfair, would be according to me, uh, is, a, is, a, is a our way of really gatekeeping. It's just saying, telling people that, look, these guys are thinking, but they're not like us. They don't have real, this is not to say, this is not to devalue uh, history writing. This is not to devalue thinking about politics. But, but in, a, in a, to put it another way, in a very unequal world where there are different idioms in which people think about the world just to privilege the idiom that we are familiar with, according to me, is an unjust way of thinking about knowledge production and society. That's my, I submit that as, as a kind of my uh, thinking about that. I, I'm, 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 I'm complicit in, 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 in this kind of creating that hierarchy and so on. But I'm also interested in puncturing that hierarchy. I'm also trying to question a hierarchy that I'm part of and I'm critical. Therefore, a lot of the time, actually, I'm a lot of doing my own auto critique, my self criticism. As I said, what I was thinking in the beginning, there are a lot of changes that we, that we, because sometimes the habit of thinking is so deeply entrenched. People don't really think the other way. They're real like blinkers. And we must, and therefore, for example, take the example of what really you think about the region. You go to outside, for example, think about, uh, I've been rereading Sarala Mahabharata of late. For example, if you look in the Banaparba, when the, the Pandavas are going inside, what, are the, what is happening? They're, 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 you know, there, is, there is a landscape in which there are a lot of the so-called non-humans exist. There is a sense of awe, there's a sense of beauty, but there's also a sense of fear. There's also a certain sense of lack of understanding. You know, something outside the pale, as it were. So I think we would be able to, we would do much more if we bring in a lot of, and now when you think about now, let's say now we are thinking of people going into the jungle, the responses are very different because the jungle itself is now seen as whenever our middle-class friends, we go to this thing, some of them would immediately see it as nature as natural resource. For a long time, people thought that, oh, Odisha has so much natural resources, why not to exploit and become rich? But you don't thank God that we didn't exploit them so heavily that actually our collective future would have been really doomed. This is not to say that, uh, uh, you know, the question of development is not a question of only exploitation of natural resources. Question of development is also a question of, you know, kind of uh, uh, question of uh, 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 um, uh, distribution, question of inequality. And therefore, the thinking about the development is a very important vector in that story of identity and identity politics at a time. But they also, the similar like nation, has inbuilt into it a teleological thinking. And after all, we have to all become, we ultimately have to have a nation. There, there can't be no non-national communities. There can be no, no non-identitarian kind of, you can say that this, some people argue in terms of 
civic spaces where identities are not always played up, they're bracketed and stuff like that. But that's something I think, according to me, uh, is, is, is very, very important that how, you know, so this is something which I would like to submit that therefore, when thinking about regionalism or region, people think about in that domain, the term that becomes very important and relevant is internal colonialism. That the regions are actually structured in a particular way in which one region actually exploits the another. In fact, sometimes people, when I was arguing about the, the, the colonial time, people say, is the relationship between in the Bengal presidency, between Odisha province and Bengal, was it relationship internal colonialism? I registered against that idea precisely because of simple idea that, that if, if Britishers are the ruling power, I cannot really say that that internal colonialism is a kind of thesis obtains because it's very difficult to sustain the, the integrity of that concept if you stretch it like that and say, oh, this is all internal colonialism. But you can say in some cases, internal colonialism. You can say about that to describe this, that development, underdevelopment problematic, which is so important in, in, in our contemporary, but they're not the only way to think about the world. That's what I'm saying. I mean, this is the way we are habituated with. This is also very important in an unequal world like ours and, and stuff like that. So there is a lot to be done in terms of social sciences and the reaction, the relationship between history, humanities, social sciences and, and stuff like that. Our idea, even the big data, even our thinking about the science, thinking about natural sciences, thinking about how we think about uh, congestion. The entire thing about the past, present and future is entirely complicated. They're no more, uh, they're no more, they're no more thought like that. They're all convenient ways in which we have parceled out things, but they're not necessarily how things can be only conceptualized like that. But we know that there are ways, these are all forms which have emerged. That's why when um, Anderson thought fiction, novel is the bourgeois form of nation and nationalism. You can say, I think Dipesh also argues something similar that, that, you know, that, that poetry becomes the way in which you imagine identity and nation. And why? Because there is a long tradition. After all, you can say prose and other genres of writing were all part of the poetry in the, in the past. When you say Kabir, Kabir didn't include only poetry in the past, in the traditional definition, aesthetics of, 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 of thinking and classifying. But that's it. So what I'm saying, Chandi, is very important questions. I think we may need uh, a long time to discuss some of these very fundamental questions about history, past, what ways we can open up because we are sometimes in a completely a cul-de-sac. We are actually in a dead end. And, and what they call in philosophy, aporias. And you cannot pierce through. And you need actually the instruments or wherewithal to pierce through these kind of aporias, I would say. That I think is something my, my humble submission to Chandi's question. Gyan, I think, Gyan, your questions are very, very important. I think the the lot many questions that you that you raised uh, some of them are uh, the political leaders question is very important i didn't have time but i think there are you know there are there are benefits that you can do by talking about the leadership style if you look at look at the utkal samilan leadership style it was a consensual style it was it, it, within the in, in the thinking about the beginning of the 20th century it is a consensual style but it is also a style which emerges as the all middle class getting educated in certain ways, but also inheriting certain ways of thinking about the past. Uh, they're not high modernizers. Like uh, you hardly find a high modernizer in, in Orissa as you find in Bengal in, in, in the late 19th century, in the sense that who deny tradition completely. In fact, much of the Odia leadership, if you find, if you ask me, they're pretty sympathetic to to bring in tradition and modern together. Because often in their own lives, they were really operating on two and multiple registers. So there is a sense one can talk about. And often I, when I make a distinction between, I don't remember which piece, but I, on the leadership between Gopabandhu Das and Madhusudan Das, I made a distinction. 
you know that why the leadership styles are very different and what is the one leadership style talks about the development madhusudan's leadership style was that you develop and you consolidate your class, class position and then you earn the right to lead the society and for gopobandhu it is just the opposite he said no it's not a question of your consolidating your power it is through compassion to empathy to your connections that you build your you you you, you spread your kind of connections across society and finally the why you know the oriya mobilization has to go in this way there are many explanations apart from some of them are quite historical conjunctural the way uh, orissa was presented itself what you call orissa in very different forms as i said garjat area mogal bandi they are very different small kingdoms big kingdoms you know with differential power and stuff like that that created a very different way that you can think about identity and the real in terms of real experience and 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 stuff like that and then and, and and therefore uh, those kind of things really came up for a very long time the lack of a single polity was visible till 1970s in orissa which meant that different political parties did well in coastal and different political formation did well in in in, in western and, and 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 central you may interpret that by saying that only a unified political society in orissa emerges only in 70s which actually is actually true because you cannot really think of a single polity when the polity is divided in, along different political parties this political party has no presence there this political party has very little presence here so so this is not a picture of a unified polity unified polity is where different political parties have stakes in different parts and then you know stuff like that so that happens much later these are all historical contingent things the last thing that you ask is a important kind of factual question you know i remember there's a book in in literature that deals with counter facts that sometimes is important to ask a counter factual question highlight historical reality the so therefore your counter factual question why odias were not really doing things violent way and so on. let me tell you the oria middle class capacity to more mobilize to under the agency and action both in the 20th century now perhaps it's likely to change as I, as i described weak mobilization you don't have resources you know even when the congress was leading things in the coastal orissa in 1920s and 30s and 40s they're constantly saying we have no resources no financial resources no mobilization they will write to somebody and somebody will tell them that look somebody in gujarat is going to put some give some money to the to the uh, utkal pradesh congress committee if you are a, if you are an ascending if you are an emerging class in the absence of a big bourgeoisie and 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 landlord class so let me come to some of the very traditional formulation class formulation you have very little capacity agentic capacity your capacity is compromised imagine if they had a huge solid financial base their actions would have been very different and and every identity doesn't have to appear in a violent way and i think uh, oriya identity doesn't manifest in in a violent way because it is remains as i said in a very moderate to low equilibrium and and you can say it's not bad thing because if the assertion between the coastal and the western orissa for example will become too violent and too um, assertive you would find sources of conflict if they remain at a lower level of equilibrium then you can think of accommodation is possible and as i said there is a deeply flawed idea which actually people thought that the 19th century idea that's how eli kedouri begins his uh, book on nationalism it's a 19th century doctrine which people believe i'm paraphrasing the first sentence that which means that there's a congruence between politics and that if you are one identity you need one state it's not possible i think this is a completely an idea which has to be if only we we we, we invest a lot on our political imagination because creating a separate state is only easy thing just by giving reservation is an easy thing but creating infrastructure to support and change inequality is the toughest thing so our way of thinking about inter regional inter community inter caste injustices have really needs a lot of imagination we are also at a dead end it's it's a it's a 1950s politics 1970s 60s when lohia and other people galvanized some of the new ideas but now this ideas post mandal has come a 
come to come to a kind of dead end we also need to think how create a better society how to create a better society of justice and, and equality and so on i'll stop there and umakant's thing i think there are a lot of very interesting questions so umakant the in only in semiotics i can tell you that the concept the, the the idea of the empty signifier is where there is no corresponding object you know the the that's the idea of the uh, i mean we always think of whether what is the distinction between an empty signifier and a floating signifier at least floating signifier means different things it's a floating thing but empty signifier is where actually it has no no corresponding object it's a discourse without an object so what really you know i'm not a very or not always super uh, committed to the idea of really driving everything through a concept i'm often tempted more to be driven by questions and 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 a new way of challenging the existing imagination of seeing the way we habitually see things uh, like state everybody you know everybody thinks everything has to be seen in the landscape of the state and society more with the state and 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 our imagination therefore has been too overshaped by state and politics if somebody asks me what are the other imagination can emerge the, the other imagination can emerge but there is something to at least to be aware of that how state and therefore i remember it's a one indian uh, who said that in indian uh, writings he always find people are writing state with a capital s upper case s he said why should state be in in, in a capital s i said that's i said that's a peculiar indian right so he said india the state looms large everybody has to but can can society be conceptualized same in with my our own discipline everybody thinks that politics is the the most important thing in society but we know the gandhi said no politics not the most important thing why should politics why should the the naturalness of politics to be to be taken for granted when it comes to uh, to society and humans you know so i'm just posing this very provocative question because they we are these are these are the have two habits we have created institutions and entire paraphernalia of our intellectual apparatus in the world and they are perpetuated in in some sense and then and, and then questions come up i would stop there thank you so much thank you i hope um, we have covered the range of questions that have come in the chat box uh, uh, if anybody wants there any to other, uh, there any other umakant is there any other question that people want to ask me i'll be happy to there is a question yes. on the on the tribal languages and stuff like that yes and yeah, yeah i think i think it's a very important question if somebody asks uh, me how to describe yes, uh, if uh, somebody has questions uh, two three questions we can take uh, they can come and directly pose those questions so there are some questions were there in this thing i can take them so to for the sake of time you know uh, uh, one of course is about the the tribal languages there is no doubt if somebody asks me how do you describe odisha how do you sum up a society of more than 400 million people what do you say between dalits and adivasis in odisha they constitute more than 40% if you add sorry for using these categories but if you just add the lower obc there will be not necessarily that they if if in a conservative estimate 25 to 30% 75 75% of of the way that your society particularly from a social configuration point of view is a is a bahujan society but not many people would describe or is a not many people describe or is as a bahujan society not many people see that there is a there is an adivasi community and and it's true that you know the the script the issue of language the issue of uh, you know that's why when ganesh devi talks about the death of languages they are not they are not empty fear they are not empty apprehension they are real and we, we know that in andaman the bo language died right the last speaker died we know other languages are you know unesco of course considers any language spoken by less than 10000 or less people is an endangered language 
language not connected to education, script, market, or in every part of the world, languages are threatened. And death of language is not merely one, one loss of language. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loss of, of a world. It's a, it's a loss of a community. It's a loss of a way of looking at. And that's, a, that's the view of the language that the, the linguistic um, identity groups fighting for linguistic identity argue, and quite rightly. A language is not merely that you, as, a, as I think uh, uh, people use, I find it deeply uh, contextual is all right, but vehicular language, according to me, is a, is a very inadequate description, expression because what is a vehicular language can be a vehicle, but language is essentially constitutive. And, and if you take the language out of uh, this thing, and, 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 and this is not to say that this is how we are genetically programmed, but that's how sociality is all about. And, and therefore, it is important to keep that in mind. And not many people think about it. As, as Oriya middle class, how many of you really think that how the Adivasi languages are actually languishing or dying? And, 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 and constantly, we, uh, we, we, we are not really, because we think that what really Adivasis need actually only development. It's nothing else. We have reduced them to a very unidimensional life we may be interested in. And that's, that's one of the reasons why their understanding of landscape is so more interesting. Because the landscape, which has also deities, gods and goddesses, mysterious creatures, you know? So, 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 so we, we don't necessarily critique them and junk them by, you know, but what is happening is, is in some sense the, and that's what the modernist, a very narrow modernist influences uh, 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 in our thinking, our thoughts actually have done, according to me, a lot of damages, uh, both politically and, and socially, and also as a, as, a, as a society. And not only Orissa alone, but in many places. Any, any other question? Uh, any other question? Oh, should we wrap up? Honinab, sir, uh, do you like to ask any question? Small question to you. I have, I, please, I have like I, it is a very interesting and very thought provoking lecture. I enjoyed it throughout, and uh, I have a small question to you. Actually, be it Odia, be it Bengali, or whatever identity you are talking about, it is basically a concept of convenience that people around which they are simple and further a cause. I am just giving my example. Be it a question: Who is this regional people or this Odia, for example? I, you know, as I was constructed a temple in Calcutta on the borders of Khidirpur, which is mostly dominated by Muslims. So there I found the who uh, this temple was constructed and who will be the management in this temple. So I was thinking whether should Odias be the management and who is then Odia? I was asking myself, who are these Odias? Are those Odias who are born and brought up in Odisha? Or are those Odias who speak in Odia? Or are those Odias who are speaking in Odisha, Odia in Bengal, but their children, are they Odias? Are they Odias? So we, we had problems. I, as you rightly said, we landed up in various problems. And at the same time, for convenience, we want to have some concept because we had the experience of Gujarat where the Odias themselves, they developed a concept called Jagana Temple. And later on, it was taken over by uh, the, some other community like Biharis. And they had to go out and they had to construct another. So this experience was with us. So basically, we thought, let it be an idea of convenience through which the people assembled together, the regional or the cultural identity that is required for, 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 for furthering a concept. It is not a free-floating concept. It is free-floating, then it doesn't get beyond certain point. And it doesn't achieve the objective that for which it has been set up. That's what my question to you. Prasanna, thank you very much uh, yeah. for the lovely question. Very great question. I only, only say that when uh, 19th century, late 19th century, but early 20th century, when within, because Orissa was not politically unified, but there yeah. was this very strict, very, very notion that the language is actually spreading out in, in various parts, including um, um, the, the feudatory uh, kingdoms. But what was important, very quickly the, the leadership realized 
unless you have a very expansive definition of who is an odia you are not able to mobilize because you are not you you cannot really mobilize people in a very narrow uh, sense of who is an odia so they adopted a very broad sense because they realized that you know this is the best way to and as you can say if i use your term convenience but there is also some political sense but there's also some um way in which you can think about particularly when you think about space and people you know after all um, um uh, selden pollock thought, thought that earlier the language is actually thought in connection with the space not with people but now there is a convergence between space language and people in our time in in modern times right from the colonial period but the other thing that prasanna you said about outside orissa for example pravasi this thing your question is again very important because you have to be really you have to really look at what works what is convenient what can what can give you greater you know what can facilitate your objectives you know so you don't have to again you don't have to go for very narrow definition of who is a pravasi odia i mean suddenly you find that there are odias but they don't really speak that much odia but there are odias so i would not say that look that's something i therefore they have to be uh, excluded or something like that you are not saying that but that i think is an important uh, issue i think this this definitional issue that who is an odia will always exercise people and people will come up with various kinds of answers some would be very narrow strict some people will have very broad understanding some people who have a very political understanding that look i don't i'm not looking at ethnically who is an odia or not i'm looking at in this region people are living people are furthering the interest of the society their odias so that's the kind of uh, answer to your question prasanna but nice to hear from you anindam babu you're back huh. on uh... ू Say something, please. Ah, uh, please continue. Uh, nothing more to add. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. Please. Okay. Yes. Because they're very. As an agraju, yes. Uh, for a lot of uh, issues and probably the idea of identity over is one issue which came up. Uh, that is consensus politics, and as you have said, expansive idea of identity. Even in 19th century, it's called Samelini, Madhusudan Das, and other leaders. They thought of consensual politics primarily because they knew when the Varisha, the kind of Varisha they were proposing, it has a lot of variated elements, which I think a clear, you know, a, one of these re recent researchers, Dr. Preeti Pushpa, has identified. in terms of domination and subordination this consensus politics developed by uttal sammelani and leaders of that time went a long way in bringing an expansive idea of identity which has informed the politics even after post independent india i think uh, uh, that point has come up professor mahapatra you have highlighted that thank you very much and uh, thank you thank okay. you very much uh, thank you very much i think it has been uh, wonderful seeing you on the screen after after a few years and uh, i very fondly remember our conversation but i think this idea that legacy you know that that the that identities when they're expansive when they are flexible they're moderate it is the most in a in a plural polity like ours that's the most productive way of really living together rather than if you make identity is very sharp very narrow its interpretation very narrow its demands very narrow then then it becomes difficult because it it is not necessary because sometimes an expansive definition of the identity actually allows more in, more capacity for inclusion than you know although 
you can say that and and the and the demarcation of the creation of the states actually have enabled those demarcation to happen so there is no more it is only in the colonial period there is an anxiety that i'm i don't have my province what will happen to my language what will happen to my literature once that has happened in a federal setup a lot of those anxieties are gone but what remains however are the only small groups that priti pushpa and may i also speak about is that within that territory there are people whose way of life is also threatened because not because people are trying to proactively do something it is just out of sheer sometimes sheer not paying attention that what can be done to create because after all odisha is also a kind of plural place you know and 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 that plural understanding of of odisha is also necessary you know we can all love a language but we can love a language we can think about the future of the language and so on but we cannot make every language so unidimensional and even within one state think that only you know there's only one identity which has to be the most important and no identity is important and our constitution of course doesn't allow that but still you know the, the that idea if you we, we keep it in check and moderate i think we would have a better option of people living together and 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 then we can address the think of inequality and 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 other things so thank you very much this is very very interesting and profound question thank you thank, thank you, you sir right now patipati i think time for us to wind up huh? sir, sir 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 thank you sir thank you so much for uh, the highly productive uh, session of over 2 hours uh, we are really really grateful to you and on, on behalf of the entire gmb family uh, thank you very much uh now i request for a formal vote of thanks dr atul kumar pradhan uh, from the school of history honorable vice chancellor professor rain nagaraju honorable speaker professor vishnu mahapatra sir and other distinguished participant uh first and foremost i thank our special guest professor vishnu mahapatra for taking out time from his busy schedule and uh, enlightening us with his special talk on th thinking about region its power and limits in our times sir your uh, no doubt your speech was inspiring and will guide us in various ways your thoughts have enlightened our minds and have uh, shown us a new path thank you so much sir then i would like to thank the torch bearer of our event vice chancellor sir uh, professor nagaraju who invite professor mahapatra to deliver the lecture thank you thank you uh, sir uh, my heartfelt thanks to uh, mohin mohammad pd council chair, uh, chairman and uh, uh, professor chandni prasad nanda and gyanav uh, sir and prasan sir for their inputs I also extend thanks to Register Jugla Sri Das for for support, and I owe gratitude to the Deputy Register Dr. Umar Chandrapati for his support. And no event can take step without hardworking leader, our Dr. Umar Chandra Misra. Thank you, sir. And I also want to thank the people who worked behind the scene execute this event, special our technical team. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Umar Chandra, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Pradhan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We are thankful to the whole team of history. Now I request our honorable vice chancellor sir for a uh, closure uh, closure of the meeting <clears throat> to announce for the closure of the meeting. Professor Mahapatra, today's webinar comes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar.